horrible people and how they inspire us. Hello and welcome back to my writing journey. I'm Ellen Byram, author of Crook Tales for Two, my Art Deco mystery, The Crime of Fashion Mysteries featuring Lacey Smithsonian, a fashion reporter in Washington, D.C., who doesn't want to be one, and I write a play or two. As an aside, it's tax day and I finished my taxes a few days ago. It's beautiful outside, our crab apple is blooming, and I'm in a pretty good mood. I'm trying to make these videos a bit more personal to show how stories evolve and how our writing changes because of our interests in personal growth. Why? Why not? And sometimes I have things on my mind to discuss. If that's of interest to you, you can like this video and you can watch it on YouTube, and if you do, please subscribe. You may have noticed that I occasionally shift the backgrounds and I like them to be attractive. This stems from having to watch so many Zoom meetings during the pandemic and staring at so many plain white backgrounds, often white walls with cracks in them. Occasionally, they might have a calendar taped crookedly on the wall and sometimes a spider climbs behind this speaker's head. Now, if you noticed a spider above mine, please let me know. I like a glimpse of your surroundings and figure you enjoy that too. Today, I am thinking about all those horrible people in our lives who not only torture us, they inspire the villains in our work. When you think about it, giving us inspiration and terrible times, bumping them off, figuratively, is the least we can do in return. Thus, giving us some psychic revenge and a good laugh or catharsis for the reading public. Now. If you don't think this happens, that bad people inspire us, you haven't seen that coffee mug that says, I'm a writer. Anything you say may wind up in my books. Being inspired by rotten people can appear in literary fiction, science fiction, and romance. But I'm betting that most of the villainy shows up in mystery novels, thrillers, and suspense. You be the judge. And that is why, in my humble opinion, Writers in the crime fiction genre are so happy. We dispose of our problems in our books and our stories during the day, leaving us time at night to be cheerful and friendly. It is the horrible people, the bad neighbors, and the dreadful bosses who worm their way into our work. These are not the moderately irritating people who annoy us. There's simply not enough time to include the less terrible, the boringly bad, the consistently appalling, but not truly terrible. And sometimes our favorite villains don't seem to be dreadful at first. They may come across as merely goofy or intrusive until you dig deeper. One of the villains who inspired me and actually caused a complete turnaround in my attitude at work at a grotesque job working for a chain of hair salons was a really goofy manager. I worked in the marketing department before I got my great reporting job. I will call this villain Leonard the Liar. Now, Leonard seemed unable to tell the truth. Leonard lied about everything important or trivial, black or white, night or day. He was hired as a supervisor and his resume upon examination by his underlings. Apparently not HR, however, seemed to be a pack of lies, a work of fiction. He even claimed to have been a rock critic when he was in college. I asked him what he thought of Jethro Tull. He looked blank and then said, Stairway to heaven? If you know, you know he wasn't a rock critic. If you believed him, he had done everything from marketing to public relations, reporting to art, and probably rocket science as well. Curiously, Leonard never believed the employees under him, whatever they said or offered as good ideas. He always had a counter idea. However, he got along with the one other person on the staff who was a liar a woman who also seemed to have plagiarized her resume and torn it out of magazines. Her degree may have been fiction. But the weirdest thing is that the two liars believed each other. He was willing to believe lies, but not the truth, which leads us to the incident. 
One summer evening, I got a call from our salon in Virginia Beach. The stylists were always instructed to call the marketing department if they had a great PR opportunity or a brilliant marketing idea. Well, a guy, I don't have a name, let's call him Slick. He came into the salon, the Virginia Beach salon, and said he was with the Chamber of Commerce and had an idea for a cross promotion. Yet he kept changing his story. He also told them he was with our company's marketing department. Clearly, he was not. Slick was looking for a stylist with very long hair who was willing to cut it into a short, dramatic style for which he was willing to pay about $200. This was unusual. The stylists were usually game to try new styles for free. Second, Slick would like the haircut to be videotaped and he would pay $300. This was unheard of. And third, for $500, he wanted the hair. Not only did he want the hair, nobody wants the hair, he wanted it dropped off at a gas station after hours. All I could think of was, dead stylist with a bad haircut left at a gas station after hours. Ick. I thanked her for calling me. She said she and a few other stylists were interested because they needed the money However, she was a little nervous because they gave Slick their home addresses. I said, does this strike you as sound marketing practice after hours gas station? She said Slick was coming back the following day and I asked her to have him call while he was on the premises to call us at the marketing department in Northern Virginia. I prepped Leonard the liar with a story and said it was fishy. He said, it could be real. Leonard, we are the marketing department. Slick is not part of us. There are only six of us and we are all here and present. But Leonard kept trying to figure out how it could be real, how the lie could be a real lie. Slick called in the middle of the day. We put him on speakerphone. Leonard was very excited about the possibilities and he and Slick were egging each other on. But I broke in. I know I am a spoil sport. And I asked Slick if he was with the Chamber of Commerce. Yes, he said, I am. And then I asked, could you tell me exactly which Chamber of Commerce you're talking about? Slick hung up the phone and we never heard from him again. Leonard the liar was crushed. It sounded real, he insisted. No, it didn't. I think Leonard resented me after that. One imaginary publicity stunt down the drain. If you're wondering, I also called the local Virginia Beach Police Department to alert them. No one thinks an after-hours gas station drop-off is legit. I told the police that I didn't know if it was some kind of college boy prank, some hair fetishist, or something worse. A detective who took it seriously called me back the next day and said he had spoken with the stylists. The upshot is no stylists were hurt in this event, and Slick didn't show up at any other salons in the area. In the meantime, Leonard drove me crazy, until one day I realized he might be the basis of a very funny character. I started to write down the idiotic things he would say, and I would giggle. I occasionally began to look forward to that terrible job where I would laugh and let my imagination run wild. That particular liar inspired my one-act play, Interviewing Techniques for the Self-Conscious. It was a delight to write. The incident with Slick and the imaginary haircut inspired the basis for Killer Hair, my first published book in the Crime of Fashion series, which is available in ebook and trade paper. The upshot is that bad behavior helps create villains who inspire us and our fiction, and you may read all about them. That's all I have for now. Think about the villains in your life, and I'll see you next week. Bye.